This program, Team Building, Creating and Managing Effective Teams, is brought to you by the Office of Formation and Discipleship within the Archdiocese of Atlanta. Hello and welcome. Thank you for your interest in learning. My name is Bill Clark. I will be the presenter for this program. If you have any questions or desire additional information, you may contact me on my direct line at 404-920-7635 or by email at wclark at archatl.com. Let us open with a prayer. God our Father, please help us to open our ears to truly hear one another. Open our mouths to share with one another. Open our mind to God's wisdom revealed in each other's ideas, thoughts, and opinions. Open our hearts so that we can become a team focused on a common goal. For where there are two or three gathered in God's name, God is there in the midst of them. In God's name we pray, amen. Let's take a look at the agenda or the learning points that we will cover in this program. First, we will define what we mean by a team, team building, and teamwork. Then we'll review the effectiveness of individuals versus teams and the fundamentals of effective teams. Then, stages of team building, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Then, the six steps in building effective teams. Characteristics of successful teams. A systematic problem-solving technique used by effective teams. The importance of team trust in team building dysfunctions of teams, or things that cause teams to underperform. Then we'll do a team building exercise and conclude with a team building process. Now let's define some important terms. What is a team? A team is a group of people pooling their skills, talents, and knowledge with mutual support and resources to achieve more effective results. What is team building? Team building is turning groups of individuals into effective teams. What is teamwork? Teamwork is working together as a team to make winning an expectation or the basic purpose for creating a team in the first place. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about teamwork. This is from Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now let's take a look and compare individual performance versus that of teams. Why are teams more effective than individuals? Well, for several reasons. First, the old saying, two heads are better than one, and that's true. The combined team resources are far greater than that of any one individual. Next there's greater probability of success with the team. Next, another expression, 
two hands get more done faster. And lastly, one absence of a team member does not cripple a team, but greatly impacts an individual. Throughout this presentation, there will be an underlying theme. The acronym TEAM, T-E-A-M, equals or stands for Together Everyone Achieves More. TEAM, Together Everyone Achieves More. Now let's look at the fundamental requirements of effective teams. These are the things that make a team really function well. First, the team has a clear purpose. They clearly understand the mission or objective of the team and they have a game plan. Second, informality. The team members feel comfortable with each other. There's no tension. They work together easily. Third, participation. Each member has a role and they participate with the team. Fourth, listening. The team members listen to each other. They ask questions. They want to know what the other person is thinking. Fifth, they allow civilized disagreement. They feel comfortable disagreeing with one another, but they are polite and friendly in the process because they are trying to achieve the ideal approach or solution. Number six, consensus decisions. They're able to arrive at decisions through discussion of each member's idea as they select the best approach. Number seven, open communication. They're able to express feelings openly. There are no secrets or ulterior motives. There are four more fundamental requirements of effective teams. Number eight, clear roles and responsibilities. Everyone understands their job, their role, and expectations. Number nine, team leadership. The team leader leads the team. Members lead in their area of responsibility, but the team leader has the overall control. Number ten, interdependent roles and responsibilities. The team members determine unique roles based on member strengths, experience, and capabilities, and then they share this expertise with the team. And lastly, number 11, self-assessment. The team periodically self-evaluates their performance in order to improve and increase results. The bottom line is this. Teams need to emulate and practice these fundamental requirements in order to become an effective team. Now let's look at some examples of effective teams from the past. First, the Great Pyramid Engineering and Build Team. What they did thousands of years ago are today a testament to their effectiveness. Next, the Manhattan Project during World War II that created the first atomic bomb that helped bring World War II to an end. Next, the construction teams who built the Panama and Suez canals, a truly remarkable engineering feat. Next, the NASA team that put the first man on the moon and brought them back to Earth safely. A remarkable accomplishment considering the technological tools of the era. Next, the Internet Development Team 
that has brought about a condition that has changed the world. Next, the NASA flight control team that brought Apollo 13 safely back to Earth. Next, you might find strange in that list, this list, but the Waffle House cooking crew who worked together remarkably well in a cramped space with high levels of activity and somehow managed to get everything done correctly. Next, the Walt Disney development team that has brought the world such wonderful productions. In sports, there are some great teams. The Green Bay Packers under Vince Lombardi. The New York Yankees under Casey Stengel. The Boston Celtics under Red Auerbach. The Yukon women's basketball team under Gino Ariema. And finally, the UCLA men's basketball dynasty under John Wooten. Now let's look at the stages of team building. Every team goes through certain stages from the creation of a team until the team is disbanded. The principle is this, that teams develop over time by hard work, dedication, and cooperation. They don't just happen. They're planned and organized so that they can be effective. There are four stages of team building. Number one, forming or getting started. Stage two, storming or getting organized. Stage three, norming or getting focused. Stage four, performing, getting results. Every effective team resolve, revolves through these stages. These stages are the work of Bruce Tuckman, who formalized this process and has become accepted by most people as the best approach for defining the four stages of team building. Let's take a look at each of the four stages of team building, starting with the first stage, forming or getting organized. The team members in this initial stage are laying the foundation for creating and organizing the team. They're trying to figure out the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the team. It's characterized by the reality that the members are initially shy and guarded. A certain amount of uncertainty prevails. They form initial opinions about their teammates. Productivity is relatively low. For example, imagine the first practice of a baseball, softball, basketball, soccer team where people are shy and guarded. There's uncertainty. Uh, you're not yet uh, productive. You're getting to know one another. This is what happens during the forming stage. What are the goals or things that happen during the forming stage? First of all, this stage can last for days or months or possibly longer. It depends on the task at hand and the deadlines involved. The goals or things that you want to accomplish include the following. The team develops a mission or purpose. Ideally, they put it down on paper so they all agree with what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Then, they select a team leader. Next, they establish initial priorities and target dates for things that they want to get done. Next, they identify the resources, skills, capabilities that are available on the team. Then, they agree 
on each member's role and responsibilities. And finally, they develop their internal team rules, regulations, and guidelines. These are the things that you get done during the forming stage. And when these are accomplished, then you're ready to move on to the next stage. The second stage is called storming or getting started. Storming starts when the team begins or initiates work on its first or initial project. In effect, the team storms. It charges into accomplishing, working on the first objective. They identify the initial strengths and weaknesses that they need to bring to bear on the issue. They determine the leadership style and approach. They've already selected the leader. Now they deal with how the leader needs to manage and interact with the team. Next, they establish communication guidelines. The who, what, when, where, and how of how information is passed up and down the organization. Next, they develop initial trust and in working relationships, so vital in working on the first initiative to make sure that everybody trusts and is working together properly. Now let's look at the goals of the second stage, the storming stage. As far as duration, it can last a year or more, again, depending upon the objective of the team and the deadlines involved. The goals they need to accomplish in the storming stage are to establish a problem-solving mentality. Their purpose is to get something done and that amounts to solving problems. They begin to really listen to each other where before they might not have been listening totally, now they're listening because each other's stake is at hand. They assume their individual team roles and contribute their skills and expertise as needed. They resolve issues and focus on the mission. It's always back to the task at hand. And lastly, they separate the judging of results from the judging of their colleagues and team mates. Their focus is on getting the job done. If they need to critique an individual, they do it positively with the end always in mind. The third stage in the team building process is norming or developing habits. The norming stage establishes teamwork as a standard, the norm, which is an ingrained repetitive habit of solving problems, getting things done, focusing on results. The team learns in this stage how to agree and also how to disagree, how to work together, how to build community, how to maintain focus, how to change based on results and facts, not on opinions and theory. And they begin to be effective meaning they're working well as a team. This is the stage where things really begin to happen. Let's review the goals of the third stage, norming. As far as duration, it can last a year or more, again, depending upon the nature of their objective 
and the deadlines involved. The goals for norming are to increase team and individual cohesion and collaboration. Next is to develop complete trust in one another. Next, to develop an appreciation for the unique differences in skills, capabilities, resources that each member brings to the team. Next, to strengthen initial relationships into more lasting relationships. To maintain open communication. To provide positive and constructive feedback in a way that allows the team to grow with each experience. Think of, for instance, a basketball team that has gone through the initial stage uh, of organization, getting to know one another. Then they move on to the storming stage where they start to practice and play games and so on. The norming stage begins to occur somewhere probably around mid-season or perhaps a little bit after that when they begin to really do what the team was brought together to do where they're increasing this cohesion, they're developing the trust, they're appreciation, appreciating each other's differences, they're strengthening their relationships, they're improving their communications, and they're giving each other positive and constructive feedback. This is where the team really begins to grow. The fourth and last stage is the performing stage or the get her done stage. Like Larry the Cable Guy's favorite expression, get her done. The performing stage develops a bias for action and getting things done. That's the purpose that the team was created. At this point, the team is highly task and people oriented. They have a unified identity now. The morale is high. The loyalty is intense. There's genuine problem solving going on that leads to optimal or ideal solutions. There's maximum or optimum team development. There's great support or experimentation in solving problems. The team now is at its most productive stage. It's routinely winning. It's that basketball team now towards the end of the year, around tournament time, where they're peaking and they're ready to demonstrate how effective they are as a team. Now let's look at the goals of things that you want to see happen or that you can identify as being accomplished during the performing stage. As far as duration, a team can go on years and years for a long time. As long as there is a need that was being satisfied, the team can endure. It can replace members and ultimately bring them up to the same speed as the rest of the team, and they can go on and on. This is how dynasties are created. This is how winning teams are created that endure over a long period of time. The things that we want to accomplish, the goals in this performing stage, are to have the team share a common vision, to be able to stand on its own feet, to be able to exceed goals and expectations, not just meet them, but to exceed. To be able to maintain a high degree of autonomy. To be able to make changes internally, automatically. To have team members look after each other. To develop a strong pride to win 
every time, every single time, the idea is to win. When you've accomplished these in this stage, you are now at the maximum point of team development. Another model that is used in building effective teams is based on the work done by the Human Resources area of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They created a six-step process. First is to create a mission statement which defines the team's purpose. Then to establish goals using a target acronym called SMART, S-M-A-R-T. SMART stands for each goal has to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and have a time target. The third step is to establish team roles and responsibilities, to assign team members to every role, to select a team leader, to establish team expectations, establish how to monitor and measure performance, and create accountability for the team and individuals. The final three steps in the MIT model are number four, to establish team ground rules for communications, mutual respect, to share experience and resources, to have one speaker at a time when they're discussing ideas or solving problems, to stay on topic, to establish time limits for their dialogue. Number five is to establish decision-making guidelines. Identify authority levels. Develop solutions to answers based on consensus or team vote or whichever is appropriate. And number six, to establish an effective group process. To listen and respond respectfully. To have freedom to ask questions. To create an open environment that's receptive to all. And finally, to get conflicts out in the open. The MIT model is just another way to look at how you go about building effective teams. They are similar to the other model, but this is just another way to look at the same thing. Now let's move on to an opposite view of team building and, and discuss what are the kinds of things that cause a team to underperform or have dysfunctions. First is absence of trust from members of the team to one another and to the team as a whole. Second, the fear of conflict, concern about raising issues or making points for fear that it might start an argument or a disagreement. Third, lack of commitment from individual team members. Fourth, avoidance of accountability. Nobody wants to assume the overall responsibility and accountability for their results or the results of the team. Fifthly, the loss of purpose or focus. Somewhere along the line, the team loses direction. These five team building dysfunctions or things that cause a team to underperform are based on the work of Patrick Lencioni in his book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. In summary, these are the things that a team leader wants to avoid, to make sure that in leading the team, developing their full potential, 
that do not they do not backslide and get involved in these dysfunctions. There is another dysfunction or something that causes a team to fail or underperform. It's because they don't know the best way to identify and solve problems. In effect, they become ineffective. There are two overall problem-solving approaches or techniques. The first we call random trial and error. This is where we try this or that until we eventually come up with a solution. Thomas Edison was good at this. He tried hundreds, sometimes thousands of solutions while trying to develop the electric light. This approach can work, but it's costly, time-consuming, and may not result in the ideal or workable solution. The second approach is what we call systematic problem solving, in which you use a organized step-by-step -step routine or formula to guide the problem solving process. This is the preferred approach for effective teams. Now, what is a systematic problem solving approach? Let's look at systematic problem solving. It's a step-by-step -step approach to solve problems. It begins with step number one, where you define the problem or issue. Try to state it as well as possible. There's a saying that is true that a problem well stated is half solved. You're familiar with the old adage when you're up to your backside in alligators, it's difficult to remember that the original purpose of the exercise was to drain the swamp, not to go chase after alligators. So it's important that the problem or issue is defined properly. After that, then you do research on the problem. Gather all the facts that are necessary to help you determine the true problem and what you need in order to solve it. The third step is to construct or develop alternative solution approaches. There is more than one way to skin a cat and you need to come up with all possible approaches that might work. The fourth step is to test each solution approach. Just experiment around with it for a while to determine which one might work best. The fifth step is then to identify, based on the testing, what appears to be the most desirable solution. You may never arrive at an ideal solution. It's far better to try a solution, and if it doesn't work, to come back and try another one than to spend forever trying to identify the best solution. Step number six is then to prepare a solution plan or how you're going to develop and implement the desired solution. Number seven is to implement the solution, get her done, start to work on it. And number eight, to follow up during the implementation process and the conclusion to make sure the solution actually solves the problem. So systematic problem solving is the key to developing consistently good solutions. If you use all eight of these steps, you will have better quality solutions. I would like to dwell for a while on the issue of trust in team building. Trust is a cornerstone for teams. It's a critical ingredient 
for creating and maintaining effective teams. Every team member has to have each other's back. Mutual trust requires that members depend on each other to achieve a common purpose. Trust is a sense of confidence that develops over time. Trust takes time to develop but can be quickly lost. The foundation for trust is belief in the character and competence of each team member. Let me illustrate with the example of acrobats. When they're high above the arena, flying back and forth, there has to be the ultimate of trust, literally life or death level of trust, as an acrobat goes from one handler to the next. They have to trust that that individual will be there before they ever attempt their leap of fate. So trust is vital in the creation of effective teams. Now a word on trust and friendship. Question, where does friendship come into play with teams? Are team members friends or colleagues or both? Well, there are some guidelines to follow. You know, you can choose your friends, but you can't always choose your teammates. It's like family. They are what they are. Your teammates do not have to be your friends, but it's a bonus if a teammate is also a friend. The key point in trust and friendship is that it doesn't matter if your teammates are your friends, as long as you are friendly, trustworthy, and compatible. Now let's have some fun with a team building exercise called Lost at Sea. If you are watching this program with a team of people, you can use this exercise to help build teamwork skills. If you're watching the program as an individual, you can do the exercise because it is fun and challenging, or you can hold it until you have a team of people to work with. Follow these instructions. Break up into teams, three to six people, based on the number of people that you have. Each team member should then read the exercise carefully. It's on the next slide. Each team member should work individually to evaluate and then rank the survival items. Next, you should come together after the individuals have developed their solutions as a team to discuss each individual evaluation and then to develop a consensus solution for each survival item. You should take approximately 20 minutes. Okay, here is the Lost at Sea team exercise. You are adrift on a private yacht in the South Pacific. As a consequence of a fire, much of the yacht and its contents are destroyed. The yacht is now slowly sinking. Your location is unclear because of damage to critical navigational equipment. Your best estimate is that you are about a thousand miles southwest of the nearest land. You have a serviceable rubber life raft with oars that are large enough to carry yourself and the crew. The total contents of all survivors' pockets 
are a package of cigarettes, several books of matches, and five $1 bills. In addition, there are 15 items that were undamaged by the fire from the boat. Your task is to rank the 15 items in their importance for survival. Place a number one by the most important and so on through number 15, the least important. Work individually, then assemble as a team and develop your final selections. Below are the items that were undamaged by the fire. A sextant, shaving mirror, five gallon can of water, mosquito netting, one case of U.S. Army sea rations, maps of the Pacific Ocean, seat cushion, which is a flotation device, two gallon can of oil and gas mixture, a small AM FM radio, shark repellent, 20 square feet of opaque plastic, one quart of 160 proof rum, 15 feet of nylon rope, two boxes of chocolate bars, and finally a fishing kit. When you complete your responses, you can view the Coast Guard recommendations on the next slide. Okay, here are the U.S. Coast Guard search and rescue experts recommendations on the 15 items ranked from number one being the most important for survival down to number 15 being the least important. You might be surprised at some of the items. For instance, number 15, the sextant. As they stated, without tables or chronometer, it's relatively useless. On the other hand, a simple shaving mirror was ranked number one because it is critical for signaling air and sea rescue boats or planes. So go over each item, see how their expert recommendations aligns with your responses. Take a little time. Now let's talk about the overall team building process. Once you've identified a team, you start with or in the forming stage. Then you move to the storming stage as you get organized and identify and begin to work on your first project or objective. Next you move to the norming stage where you focus on continued team development. If you do these first three steps well, the team will move to the final stage of performing or the get or done stage where you achieve the true purpose of the team. Your team can stay in the performing stage for years or as long as there's a need to have that team do what it was created to do. Lastly, how do you measure team effectiveness? How do you know if you've got a good team? You're getting things done, but you know, how do you know? Well, first is, is the team fulfilling its mission and purpose? And second, is a team getting things done well and on time? If the answer to the, both of these questions are yes, then your team is effective. 
Okay, let's summarize and review quickly what we've covered. We defined team, team building, and teamwork. Then we reviewed individuals versus team performance. Next, characteristics of effective teams. Then the four stages of team building, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Then steps in a building effective teams model. Next, systematic problem solving technique. Importance of team trust. Dysfunctions of team building. Then we did a team building exercise and concluded by talking about the team building process. If you have any questions about any material covered in this presentation, you can contact me, Bill Clark, on my direct line at 404-920-7635 or by email at wclark at archatl.com. I'd like to leave you with one important thought. That's the acronym TEAM, T-E-A-M. Together, everyone achieves more. Thank you for your participation in this learning program. Good luck and God bless you. Thank you. This program has been brought to you by the Office of Formation and Discipleship within the Archdiocese of Atlanta.